Good morning, campers. Welcome to Radio Camp Half, of Percy Jack's Relong Podcast. I'm your host, Zach. And I'm B. In this week's episode, we read Chapter 12 of the Battle of Labyrinth, I Take a Personal Vacation. You know, it's one of those where you have to, you know, pop on the Hawaiian shirt, get a fruity drink with maybe has pineapple in it, and Percy Jackson did chill by the beach a little bit this chapter. What did you think of it, B? Um, this is kind of pretty similar to what I predicted, if I remember correctly, last episode. Um, I had an idea that he'd be sort of recovering from from whatever the heck happened last chapter. We don't exactly know the logistics of how he was able to sort of summon a geyser that saved his butt from being destroyed by all those um, sea demons. But he did, and it sure messed up his whole body. Yes, yes, it totally wrecked his body, and this is one of those chapters where I feel like this might be one of the saddest chapters in all of Percy Jackson. Yeah, it's very... Um, it's bittersweet, that's what the word I would use for yeah, it. Yeah, it's bittersweet. There's something about it that feels like a very, like, I guess it is like a timeless story of someone who's sort of cursed to live in a certain way that's like, it's not exactly... You know, we've we've talked about other figures before in Greek myth who've been cursed. You know, uh, Atlas was forced to hold the world up, and um, Medusa was turned into yeah, snakes. Exactly. Like, there's a lot of different punishments. I mean, Kronos was cast into Tartarus. There's all sorts of different ways that these figures have been punished um, or cursed in one way or another. But it's almost sadder that Calypso, who we'll we'll get to, is. Like, she's not exactly in the worst place in the world. Like, it's kind of nice, but it's like this this deceptively nice seeming place because obviously she can't actually have any companionship and we'll get to that. And it's just, it's a very sad circumstance. This this chapter kind of was very, like, touchingly depressing. <laughs> and that's a common theme when it comes to, like, Greek punishments, especially mythology. That They have, like, a sense of, like, dramatic irony to them. Kind of like the crime fits the punishment. Like there's some of them. Like I always forget the name of the guy. Like he's he's chained to a boulder, and a crow comes and eats his liver, and then at night it just regrows back again. Uh, but you even you have things like Daedalus, where like he he tried his best to help everybody, and in the end he well he does murder somebody, but like he tried to like you know the means justify the ends almost, but because of that he's punished. Like. When it comes to the Greeks, they know how to, like, punish people. Like, there's so many great punishments in Greek mythology. It's like, if we did any of these things in, like, our life, like, I think people would be, like, scared straight. But here it's a little different because when it comes Prometheus, to Calypso... Prometheus, by the way. Is, it, it, oh, so he, it is Prometheus. Yeah, because he's the guy who brought fire, so that was his punishment. Yes. Oh, yeah, that makes sense because he also kind of created man a little bit, too. So that, you know, the crime fits the punishment. But, yeah, um, sorry, I had to do a fact check on that because it was bothering me. I couldn't remember. <laughs> Getting back to a little bit, when it comes to Calypso, it's more like it's almost like torture in a way. It's like a cruel punishment of like this weird purgatory almost. Where like yeah, purgatory she's... is a good word for it. I feel like there there must be other examples in pop culture that are similar where someone is sort of like they're in a nice place, but they're not. It's not actually nice because they're sort of trapped there. And I don't know. That's definitely. A theme in other mythology but i can't think of an example what you mean like the midwest like you're stuck in a really nice place but there's nothing to do <laughs> everyone's nice but you're in the midwest yeah sort of honestly but um, oh my god it's like you're like in kansas or like you're in like wichita kansas where pretty much nothing happens and the most exciting thing is is going to the chilies at night well, yeah, but then every once in a while there's a tornado and then you meet a witch and stuff, and that's cool. Um, well, it could be worse. I didn't say, you know, purgatory. Well, I mean, the Wizard of Oz is purgatory, too, if you think about it. It's a terrifying place. It's whimsical, but terrifying. I think, we well, we've talked about the whole magical world thing a little bit, and that's, like, a bit different, in my opinion, because that's sort of, like, a magical place that also has, like, a lot of chaos to it, and that's what's threatening about it. Like, we compared The Wizard of Oz with, say, Alice in Wonderland and that kind of thing. But this is, like, a different kind of circumstance where it's just, like, everything is provided, but it's, like, you can't stay there forever kind of thing. It's Here it is. This is what I think this is. It's, uh, it's not torture, but it's a fate worse than death. Like, you can be punished, but here's the thing. This is the same kind of like juxtaposition. Like we think this is like horrifying, but this is the gods doing. Like yes, they have like weird like visitation rights and stuff, but this is like the gods being vindictive 
over thousands upon thousands of years against the Titans, even for people that are like so disattached, like all her crime was Calypso's crime was was just being a daughter of Atlas. And supporting him too. Well, we'll get to it, but yeah, it's um this is such a sad, sweet chapter. There's something about it that even though it's like not that long, you get the sense of how it's maybe like the way that time moves differently, n- not unlike the labyrinth where you don't know how many days have passed and Percy and Calypso c- sort of start to build this interesting bond. Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, yeah, I was going to say it's a little like Stockholm Syndrome. It's a little like sort of any story where a hero gets nursed back to health, like he's bound to. I mean, if we remember correctly, literally when... Percy meets Annabeth the she's first nursing thing them back to health. she's nursing back to health like this is a pattern he's established where he makes a dumb brave decision he gets his butt handed to him on a silver platter and he wakes up with some ambrosia and stuff being fed to him by some pretty girl who he's all of a sudden in love with so like he has a type <laughs> I'm not saying Percy Jackson has a type but I mean if we look at the three main candidates we have Calypso Rachel Elizabeth Dare and Annabeth I mean, there's kind of like that weird like hero complex also. It's like, save me, save me. And Percy's like, oh, I'll help you guys. And then I'll get my butt kicked. And then you'll nurse me back to health and you'll save me. The nursing back to health trope is interesting because it really can be the basis of like sort of a meat cute. And it can also veer into like misery territory. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The fine line between Stockholm Syndrome and being nursed back to health is it's fine. Well, the difference, though, is that in Misery, that was done on purpose, That's whereas true. like yeah, the nurse back in health is yeah. kind of, uh, you know, it, it's supposed to be like a nice, nurturing, humbling thing. I always think about like the wartime stories of like the GI that falls in love with the pretty gal nurse. And they have a bunch of babies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, that's what you kind of think about. Even though that the circumstances of this are less creepy, it is kind of a weird scenario where at the end of the chapter, I mean, we'll get to it, but like. Calypso's sort of pressuring him to stay, but she knows that he can't. It's like a weird situation where it's like, okay, yes, you like each other, but do you love each other? Like, you're both, I don't know, there's, it's kind of a bit of a ridiculous thing to assert that you love someone when I feel like they haven't really talked that much, right? Oh, I'm gonna, I just have like the biggest grin on my face because I can use a Back to the Future reference now. Oh, here we go. So in Back to the Future, how does Marty screw up? And, like, almost gets himself unbirthed, almost, or, I guess, unconceived. Oh, doesn't he, like, date his his mom? And then... But what happens? How does that happen? Because uh, in the context of the story, uh, Marty McFly accidentally prevents his, his father, George McFly, from being hit by a car. And then she falls in love with him because she takes care of him. Right. But because Marty did the exact opposite, and he's the one that got hit by the car. And right. she nursed him back to health. Even though they don't have any chemistry whatsoever... Like, it's the same thing. It's the idea of, like, falling in... It's a weird trope, actually, if you think about it. It actually is a very popular trope of Yeah, the- I mean, I think it's, like, a psychological thing, too. I mean, I don't... I'm no, no expert, but I, I'm pretty sure that there's something to be said about if you are doing something kind for someone else, then it makes people... Like, it makes people feel good to do good, sort of. So, like, of course she's going to like Percy because he gives her the opportunity to do that kind of thing. And also, obviously, she's, like you know, hard up for any kind of company because, like, literally there's nobody around. And then he obviously just needs her help. So it's kind of like this this codependent relationship where they inherently need each other and maybe not in a healthy way. Um, It's really sad. (laughs) It's also like a fish out of water story where Calypso doesn't understand, like, things like Manhattan and also there's like she's so disattached I was waiting for like the reference it's like I wonder when the next Nirvana album comes out when's that Kurt Cobain cracking on that next album and Percy's like uh 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 yeah well, Stone Temple Pilots I mean isn't it okay so the backstory basically for the chapter is he he meets her and at first we're not really sure who she is and there is a level of suspicion about Calypso because we've met other characters in the past who seemed nice at first and then ended up being scary, specifically speaking of Cersei. It's actually kind of the joke about that because we're so used to like the idea of pretty much like, okay, Percy's in this situation and how is he going to end up messing this up or how is this person going to be evil? Whereas I think that's actually the, they really 
I think Rick Ryden like leans really into this joke to the point of where it like goes 360 degrees and you realize that Percy Jackson kind of is like the jerk in this situation. Like, well, yeah, oh, there's wait. like a here, let me try to find the um the conversation he has with her when he first meets Calypso. Um well there's the um the line where he says he's this is sort of like his internal monologue or like the narration, I guess, where he says, um I tried to re- remember what I knew about Calypso from the old myths. I'd heard the name before, but I couldn't remember. Was she a monster? Did she trap heroes and kill them? But if she was evil, why was I still alive? Um, then later, he brings up Cersei. You're also in like that mindset where Percy Jackson is in a very vulnerable spot. So as the reader's like, reading it, they don't you realize that's like, yeah. you can't trust anybody, but also he's too weak to fight back. So like this could easily be his demise. Like, not only is he not in the right mindset, but they even establish that he's horribly burned and that his his legs don't work as they used to. Isn't that a song? <laughs> when your legs don't work like they used to before. Something like that. Uh, but <laughs> Maybe. I think that's a song. I don't remember. But uh, but you, you see what I'm saying at here. It's like even how they have Calypso and Cersei... Uh, sound very very similar i mean they both have c's i mean obviously rick Riordan didn't write it but he's intentionally juxtaposing them for sure because he even brings up cersei and the idea that like anything that is seemingly nice can actually be what's the word i'm looking for like sinister i guess it like even when we talk oh my god like sour patch kids first they're sour then they're sweet or more like the first they're sweet then they're sour it's sort of the reverse because it's similar to like when Percy and the gang go to the Lotus uh, Casino, and it's the same thing of, like, they... It, we compared that to, what, like, the poppy field in Wizard of Oz, where that is... It's more like drugging them, like, lulling them into a sense of security, but it's not real, and then the sense of time, similarly, is... It's delayed, it's weird, they think that barely no time has passed, and then, of course, it's been several days, like, that kind of thing. So it's not exactly dissimilar from that but even percy also makes a point to say that it's different than that he in this case well he's um, even very upfront about her like are you a monster are you gonna murder me are you gonna turn me into a guinea pig and she's like no perseus jackson i won't turn you into a guinea pig and i like that because you have that sweet innocence and this adds again to the greek tragedy going back to the idea of there's only really two types of plays in greek culture which were the comedies and the tragedies and this is the tragedy. She's falling in love with Percy and Percy is being goofy and stuff. But then like, you know, the fates are very cruel in the situation of having, hey, look, I love you, Percy Jackson, but we can't be together because you, you know, you're trying to save the world. And this is where like, she's pure good almost. It's actually really weird to think about like, you have the Titans who are, you know, we've always conceived of them as like evil, terrible people. But then you have Calypso, who's the exact opposite. She even brings that up. Like not all Titans are evil. We are just, you know, doomed to our fates because of, like, lesser men or lesser gods. And I find that fascinating. I mean, it, it's an interesting conversation. Like, they don't really speak that much. I mean, it's hard to, like, gauge exactly how long he's there, so I don't know how to judge it. But he is, like, in a in an altered state, so they don't talk a ton. But when they do, it's, like, it's interesting because this gives him a bit of a respite where he's not pursuing the quest. And instead, he gets to have these, like, deeper conversations about the like implications of like okay well where do you fall in this war between the titans and the gods do you just believe this because of who your parents are and it's an interesting opportunity for percy to think more deeply about what he's doing instead of just sort of barreling forward and pursuing what he wants to pursue because they're in this like weird bubble where there's nothing else to do but talk and rest really so this is a very switzerland situation here with the war it's not even really switzerland but she's she's sort of bringing up an interesting point because at first she says oh well i took my father's side you know of course i did maybe i was wrong but that's what i did because i'm his daughter like and then percy's incensed about this well, here's the thing, though, like when you are a parent and like your kid, you look up to your dad as if like they're a god for the most part. So you're always going to normally pick the side of your father, or pick the side of your mother until you realize, you know, when you actually can distinguish what what is between right and wrong at times. Like, you know, there's people that fight against each other, like inner fighting. But here she's so certain. And because of that, you know, that's what dooms her. If she didn't was like very lackadaisical and like she didn't go into the Titan War and support her father. 
what would her life be like? Maybe it might be worse. Maybe it might be better. We'll, we'll never know. It's one of those what ifs. Like this chapter, it's a big what if. It gives you more of an opportunity to like really delve into the implications of what's happening. Because a lot of the time, especially I think in this book in particular, because they're in the labyrinth, which sort of adds a sense of urgency to everything that they're doing. There really isn't any downtime, even when they're like sort of just camping out or going to sleep or whatever. They're always keeping watch. There's like a sense of like no moment to speak, even more so than the typical like patented riot and like, oh no, we can't talk about this right now because there's a time. monster. Not enough thing. time. Interrupt it, not us. enough time. Never us. enough time. And that's why it's like always such a relief when there's either a scene like this or no, you know, thinking all the way back to like different. Uh, moments in other books where the, they're traveling one way or another they're either on a train or in a car where there's like this lull in between one location from another or this sort of liminal space where there isn't as much pressing like something threatening them or whatever that they're allowed to sort of speak out loud all of these anxieties that are just subtext and not text like i mean i'll just uh read the the conversation that they have about the titans where um Calypso says, I did support him in the first war. He's my father. What? But the Titans are evil. Are they? All of them? All the time? She pursed her lips. Tell me, Percy. I have no wish to argue with you, but do you support the gods because they are good or because they are your family? I didn't answer. She had a point. Last winter, after Annabeth and I had saved Olympus, the, the gods had a debate about whether or not they should kill me. That hadn't been exactly good, but still, I felt like I supported them because Poseidon was my dad. Perhaps I was wrong in the war, Calypso said, and in fairness, the gods have treated me well. They visit me from time to time. They bring me word of the outside world, but they can leave and I cannot. So it's an interesting thing that she brings up, especially I think because she's just reflecting on this all the time. That's all she can do. And I think what Rick Riordan does here is very deliberate in this chapter, and that is because you're able to slow down time and you're seeing a different perspective because... For all of Percy Jackson, Percy Jackson has a bias. He believes in the Greek gods. He believes that, you know, they're inherently good. Whereas you finally get a daughter of a Titan who kind of brings in weird like juxtaposition where uh, Percy Jackson and his bias is kind of contested almost a little bit here because he's only he's so sure that the Greek gods are so good. And then you realize that, wait, are the Titans? I mean, obviously they're evil or evil creatures, but from a certain point of view, they're not. Or are they any worse than the gods? Well, yeah, I are think they is any worse? Because up. if you look at how the Greek gods do everything, like they do things like turn Medusa into a snake lady, they do things like yeah. Is that any worse than like eating your children or whatever? Yeah. You know, it's like not that different. Um, yeah, and that's the great thing about this chapter is you have this idea now. You have this strong theme of like morally gray characters because the gods, as we know already are fallible like they make mistakes they are petty they have all these like strifes and they pretty much have a bunch of infighting and we finally get this like a weird like microcosm of percy jackson and calypso kind of talking it out here and it's so fascinating to see like you're finally opening up to different avenues of like well maybe this war is a little different than we thought it was going to be it's not clear cut like good and evil maybe there's more to it than just we think like ideologically speaking calypso isn't too different from Luke. He just has fallen on the other side where he's following Kronos out of a sense of revenge of his parents. Instead of following his parents, it's sort of like the reverse justification. He's using Kronos to, you know, justify the means because he's the one that's the most powerful and he has he gives him a shot. Right. And he has a thing against gods. So it's not really that he's following Kronos so much as he's anti God and he happens to want to align with Kronos because they are like, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. Yes, both of them have very similar interests and very similar goals. And I put that in quotation marks. Yeah, even though they're not, I don't think they necessarily always agree. But it's it's interesting because I feel like there are a few conversations that Luke has had with Percy that are tinged with a sense of defensiveness, I guess, on Percy's end because he can admit that in some ways he's just following what the gods are doing because he feels a sense of familial obligation or whatever, and he's not really thinking critically about how sometimes the gods do do incredibly unfair, like, cruel things that are just as bad as maybe what the, the Titans have done. And 
he's not as receptive to that when it's Luke saying something like that. But here he's in this vulnerable position. There's really nowhere else he can go. He doesn't have a lot of other distractions. It's not like a heightened moment where he's in a fight scene. They're sitting down and talking and she's just sort of bringing up this really contentious thought like, wait a second. I mean, are the gods really that great? They're not. We've talked about it. It's been a real conflict from the very beginning of the series that the gods aren't that great. And we have another thing here when it comes to the small little microcosm where Calypso's curse is pretty much falling in love with like a hero that can't really fall in love. But here at her slim moment, a chance of like convincing Percy, he almost goes for it. He almost goes for it because he almost like lets go of like his duties and stuff. But what ends up happening is Hephaestus comes in and that's what kind of shakes him back to reality. If Hephaestus never came, which is very weird when it comes to the idea of the gods actually interfering because the gods interfere so much from Percy Jackson, even though they say they don't, is that once Hephaestus comes back, Percy Jackson kind of snaps back to a sense. This is where the curse kind of happens again, where Percy Jackson understands his duty and obligation, which is worse. So that they're on this weird island called Ojigia, which is confusing because it's sort of, it's an island, but they're surrounded by fresh water. I don't really, are they in a lake? I don't know. B, it's pretty much like the island from Lost. It only makes sense in the context of where they are. Or I like to call this Ojigia kind of like uh, Wisconsin. This is the Wisconsin island. If you've ever watched Zack Snyder's uh, remake of Dawn of the Dead, for some reason in Wisconsin, there's a tropical island. Just don't question it. Yeah, there's just, we can't find the justification for that. I don't know. Um, But when he's describing it, he is still aware of his responsibilities, right? Like he, he's not like drugged and he- But it's not on the forefront of his mind. He he brings up what he needs to do and that his friends are waiting for him to um, Calypso. He feels that sense of concern. It's not like- all of that is washed away because he's there. It's, I think, partly because he's weak physically and partly because he does feel mentally exhausted about all of this questing he's been doing. So it does seem very appealing to take a break from that. I think this more has to do with the curse. It's kind of like the fates pretty much lull him into this false sense of security where Calypso is like almost like it's like on the edge of like he pretty much is like a yes or no 50 50 shot. And the second he's about to say yes, that's when, you know, the fates interfere and that's when they bring Hephaestus. Yeah. Okay. I found the, the passage that like really describes like how it felt to be on the island. I don't know exactly how much time passed. Like Calypso said, it was hard to keep track on the island. I knew I should be leaving. At the very least, my friends would be worried. At worst, they could be in serious danger. I didn't even know if Annabeth had made it out of the volcano. I tried to use my empathy link with Grover several times, but I couldn't make contact. I hated not knowing if they were all right. On the other hand, I really was weak. I couldn't stay on my feet more than a few hours. Whatever I'd done in Mount St. Helens had drained me like nothing else I'd ever expected. I didn't feel like a prisoner or anything. I remembered the Lotus Hotel and Casino in Vegas, where I'd been lured into this amazing game world until... I almost forgot everything I cared about, but the island of Ojigia wasn't like that at all. I thought about Annabeth, Grover, and Tyson constantly. I remembered exactly why I needed to leave. I just couldn't. And then there was Calypso herself. She never talked much about herself, but that just made me want to know more. I would sit in the meadow, sipping nectar, and I would try to concentrate on the flowers or the clouds or the reflections on the lake, but I was really staring at Calypso as she worked the way she brushed her hair over her shoulder and the little strand that fell on her face whenever she knelt to dig in the garden. Sometimes she would hold out her hand and birds would fly out of the woods and settle on her arm. Lorikeets, parrots, doves. She would tell them good morning, ask how it was going back at the nest, and they would chirp for a while and fly off cheerfully. Calypso's eyes gleamed. She would look at me and we'd share a smile, but almost immediately she'd get a sad expression again and turn away. I didn't understand what was bothering her. So, the boy's in love. That's why he sta- wants to stay, <laughs> really. Well, the boy's in love, but also, I mean, you, can you blame him? He's pretty much dating a Disney princess at this point. She talks to the birds. Even there's one point where Percy Jackson says she's the most beautiful creature alive, but she, he doesn't want to say it openly because of um, Aphrodite. Because if he says that, he'll be, like, screwed. Right. So, th- the closest we can get to theorizing why he feels so lured into this place, it isn't like like he's being drugged or tricked or mind melded in some sort of way that makes him want to stay it's more like there's a sort of 
inevitability of him falling in love with her because of the way that she's designed and he's designed and their fate. And specifically later on when he meets uh, Hephaestus again, when Hephaestus like zooms in on a, I don't know, a cool kick flip of fire and is like, hey, uh, remember how Aphrodite, or like actually Percy brings it up where he's like, oh, do you think it's Aphrodite who's trying to like mess with me? And there's no way to know for sure. Even Hephaestus doesn't know. But it could be that, like, it's it's just love, basically, that's keeping him there, which is, like, I don't know, a kind of funny reason for him to be trapped somewhere because, you know, he's a teenager and that's what happens. They think with their hormones and maybe not with their brain. <laughs> I don't necessarily think it's, like, a funny reason because it's, like, a very worldly reason. Like, sometimes people fall in love and they'll pretty much take their career to the wayside just to be with somebody. I mean, I guess that's true. Yeah, it happens to a lot of people. I think... It, I think it has to do with the idea of being so human. Like, you know, what, what was our tagline? We keep staying mortal. Percy Jackson is a very mortal person. He has these flaws. He thinks with his head, but not really at times. Like, he thinks with his heart. Uh, like, he's very passionate. Like, if you always think about, like, how like he's, like, a go-getter, like, every rash decision he's made has been to protect people. Like, he pretty much caused Mount St. Helens to pretty much almost erupt. Because of Annabeth, he's jumped off of the That's gateway true. arch. He's, he's done a all romantic. these. Ter- yeah, he's a romantic. And th- I feel like I don't know. Part of me thinks that this is a very well drawn chapter to the point where it almost gets me to be like, "Oh, isn't that sweet? How much he loves Calypso, and it's so sad that he has to leave the, the two of them. They're star crossed lovers, and they belong together. But it's like the fates, all of that kind of stuff. I'm being made to feel that way." by the way it's written, and they write Calypso in such a way that, of course, you sympathize with her, and she seems so nice and sympathetic. But then on the other hand, you're like, wait a second, you were just in love with Annabeth. Like, what? Listen, buddy, you gotta make a choice. You can't just all of a sudden love this Calypso person when you don't really know each other, and you're really interacting in a very specific, conflict-free way. Like, they're you know, sealed off from the outside world. It's sort of like, you know, that that thought experiment of, oh, if you ask these questions to someone, then you'll fall in love kind of thing. Like, they're really removed from any external stressors. All they can do is talk about each other and bond, and it's the fates bringing them together. But I don't think it's all that romantic if he were to stay and, you know, abandon Annabeth, who is this person who's been like a slow burn kind of you know, pining that the two of them have had for several books now and to, like, contrast that with, like, oh, he got sick and then was taken care of by that girl is kind of frustrating because I'm like, dude, like, she's not the one. Annabeth clearly was there for you just as much as she has over a longer period of time. I think people don't give enough credit to Rick Riordan because what he's doing here is almost like a magician's trick where he has this sleight of hand where you're, like, looking at it and you see, like, at the forefront... He's writing pretty much what the parameters are and the criteria is for like a Greek tragedy. You have you build up these two people and by the end of the play, something has to give or the character always has to make a choice. It might be a good choice, might be a bad choice. But here, Percy Jackson has to make a choice and he has to live with it. That's just like the uh, the Greek play Medea is a lot like that. No, not, you know, Tyler Paris Medea. For some reason, people always think about that, but. Medea is very similar to the situation as well as like I even would use this is going to sound really bad I, I would even use Julius Caesar as an example from William Shakespeare that it's very much in this style even though it's a it's you know Roman it, it follows the parameters of like a Greek tragedy well I mean it was any Shakespeare he's always kind of following that storytelling path same as with Shakespeare he had the comedies and he had his tragedies you had like Romeo and Juliet but see that's what makes a, a good story unfortunately is you have to have like that love romance and the tragedy why do you think the titanic is like the third highest grossing movie of all time it's a it's an action movie it's literally the second vhs is an action movie interesting thing to you cited titanic and romeo and juliet they're very similar in that it's also like a very heightened specific setting that is like kind of removed from the real world like whether it be because they're young or they're like in the certain, like... D- different class structures. I guess in Titanic, it's different class. Yeah, and the, the class structure or whatever, or they're, they're star-crossed because of time, because of who they are, for all these different reasons. But in, in all of these cases, they don't really know each other that well. And I think that that's the only way to, like, build this specific type of romance that Rick Riordan's trying to do, where he's like, oh, well, they're, like, really in love with each other, but, like, they're only in love with each other in the way that you can be when you don't think of someone as a whole person. Like, it... 
they're not facing any sort of conflict together. They're like pie in the sky thinking about like, oh, well, I just love this person because, you know, you complete me. And it's it's not it's like the hopeless romantic idea of what love is. And it's not like grounded in reality. Obviously, I mean, this is literally not grounded in reality. They're not in reality. They're No, this is not grounded in reality at all. And then there's like situations like in Romeo and Juliet where Romeo is like, oh, I wish I was like a glove upon that cheek. Yeah, exactly. And it's... you're like, wait a second. This guy just wants to be a gl- like he wants to be an inanimate object just to touch her face. And even with here in Percy Jackson, you have that sense of like, I actually, you know what? You know what? This is actually, oh, my God. It's a lot like a Midsummer Night's Dream where you have the idea of like the fairies coming in and like I'm making these two people fall in love and how it's almost like a dream but it's also like heightened reality at the same time it's actually it's very similar to that play if you think about it oh well because it's like truly the fates bring them together too yeah I mean you get that sense it's it's really interesting because this chapter is so well written you almost believe it like I almost was like oh wow it's so sweet that they love each other but I'm like wait no he loves Annabeth who's this girl I mean, I'm sad for her, but like, my dude. And then we have like the argument, I guess we would have to touch around this without being hypocrites, is that Percy Jackson has all these girls throwing themselves to him, and then there's like, of course Annabeth gets jealous at all this stuff, especially with like Rachel Elizabeth there. Like, he's, she's actually a little justified a little bit in this chapter. It's like, wait a second. Right, he gets a lot of attention. It's true. I understand in some ways. I mean, we roasted Annabeth a little bit in the beginning of this book, but we understand, like, he does have that sort of... I'm the chosen one hero chip on his shoulder. And he doesn't even necessarily do it intentionally, but he does get a lot of attention from all sorts of people. So I get, I get that jealousy. It's a totally like Rick Ryden's right in this specific way where it's almost like a, like a boy power fantasy and how he does literally nothing. All he, all he did was get himself almost killed. And all of a sudden he's falling in love with another girl. And then he like lands in this paradise where this girl loves him. Yeah. That is pretty funny. Like as far as a, like a fantasy, just like, he didn't have to do anything but just be the hero that was sent to her. And then it it's so messed up because then it's cruel. Like, obviously, they know that it's not going to work out. No one ever stays because not only are they designed to fall in love, they're also designed to not stay together. Like, it's this really messed up curse that Calypso has. And, and that's why I bring up, like, the Romeo and Juliet comparison because it has to be love but with tragedy with a tragic ending i guess spoiler alert for romeo and Juliet. yeah by the way that one of them dies and then the other, the other one, one takes kills. uh pretty much kills himself too at least they don't die in this chapter that would have been weird a weird choice well they don't well remember there's a thing it's like if you're on the island you can't die so there's like that temptation of like just stay on this island you'll never die and no one will come and kill you pretty much like when you're on this island you're invincible and it's very tempting. It's the idea of like mortality versus, you know, immortality. But it is purgatory, like we've talked about. Like you're trapped in this one place forever. Well, yeah, um, that's the same thing as like the Midwest. You're trapped there forever. I keep thinking of, of San Junipero, that episode oh. of Black Mirror. I saw it recently. I love that episode of Black Mirror. Yeah, yeah. It's very similar to this. I think the idea of like the perfect paradise, but you know that in the back of your head, it's too good to last. Like there's no, there's no such thing as like something's too good. There's always has to be a catch. Like we look at like the Lotus Casino. Yeah, I mean, obviously that story is very different because it's one thing if you don't have any other things pulling you to the real world. You know what I mean? Like that's the very that's the inherent difference in like something like San Junipero, where it's like here's this world where you could live forever and it's all great, but the only catch is you have to live leave everything you have else behind. And with this, it's like Percy actually does have a a life that he can't leave behind. He has all these obligations and in some ways that makes it more tempting because he he has to reckon with all these prophecies and these different people that he has to take care of and worry about and whether or not they'll, they'll live or die and this war that he's sort of at the center of in a lot of ways and it's so tempting to cop out of that i guess but he's too much of a loyal person to do that obviously here's the thing though this is where i think rick roger does the most brilliant thing at this moment nothing's happening it's purgatory for one moment he actually kind of like thinks about like wait what if i just stop everything and this is stupid like he actually has that thought where he has the 50 50 shot of like well i can just abandon everything and this is gonna be great i'm gonna hang out with my girlfriend all day very much like a teen romance type of thing i'm gonna skip school me and my girlfriend are gonna run around we're gonna get a dog and we're gonna solve mystery yeah yeah play hooky on the god war you know yeah just go full i'm just gonna ferris bueller this stuff and hang out i mean ferris bueller at least is like they go off and do fun stuff instead of they're just sort of like trapped in this weird purgatorial island well percy jackson isn't the sasha's king of chicago 
So yeah, you know, no, exactly. That goes. It's very different. Yeah. And I love that about this is that once again, when you have chapters that like slow down and almost com- go to like a complete halt and like you have a character that has to make a decision, he has to know what's, you know, what's right in the world. And like, I guess it's like the idea of like the needs of the many outweighs the needs of the few. I like using that Star Trek reference for many, many reasons, but this is the case. It's like Percy Jackson could pretty much, you know, worry about numero uno himself but he decides, you know, there's too many people riding on the situation. He doesn't even think about, like, his mom. He thinks about Annabeth. And once Hephaestus comes in, which, you know, he comes in and pretty much shows I'm that- so relieved that Hephaestus shows up because he just, not only does he snap Percy back into reality a little bit, he also snaps the reader back into reality. You're like, oh, right, right, yes. Okay, yeah, he does have responsibilities. It's like in the end with, like, the coconut cordials. And it's how like you get lulled into like a face. Yeah, it sense is actually very similar to the end. I kept thinking that in, in unfortunate events, they're on an island. They're sort of like lulled into this sense of like, you know, of uh, yeah, false safe. I guess it's real safety, depending on whether or not you want to opt out of your responsibilities. But yeah, like they're just sort of like they're opting out of living in a society or caring about any responsibilities. It's just you know. Not doing anything. Yeah, and the, the beginning of that book is pretty much telling Count Olaf to go F himself, and he's not allowed to be on the island, which is great. Like, well, I guess that's more spoilery stuff, but you, you understand like, that false sense of security. <laughs> yeah, let's spoil everything we can think of. Um, oh, yeah, no. Did you know Harry Potter's birthday is today? Did you know Harry Potter is a wizard and also a horcrux? Yeah, I was shocked, too. The thing is, someone's probably listening who's like, really? And in, to which case... I'm sorry, but like, dude, there's a theme park. The second there's a theme park. Yeah. That's like being like plot twist. Mickey Mouse is a mouse. <laughs> what? B? Oh, my <laughs> God. I did not know that. You know, that man signed my checks so many years. I didn't know he was a giant mouse. I was like really confused how he got his huge gloves on to sign my checks with his nice cursive that said Bob Iger on it. Anyway, we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of the point of this chapter is you're supposed to be sidetracked a little bit here. That's and true. once Hephaestus comes in and he snaps him back into reality, like, I like how Hephaestus comes in and, like, this gigantic, like, whirlwind of fire. He's kind of a chill dude. I'm, I'm really liking Hephaestus and his sort of, like, blunt honesty in a lot of ways where he just shows up and he's like, listen, you could stay, you could go. I mean, I think Hephaestus's blunt honesty comes from the idea that he's horribly deformed and like he's not really a people person. He doesn't understand the idea of subtlety. Like he just very honest and straightforward. Like when you get to the part, like he summons a TV and starts showing like Mount St. Helen, and he's pretty much like, "Oh yeah, so you pretty much like almost screwed the world over by basically almost like waking up a titan, like a huge titan." As well as millions of people have to be evacuated from this area, but you did a good job, kid. You did a good job. I love, like, just the conversation they have, because Festus is, like, he's not forceful, but he's just very grounded in reality. He just says, um, don't ever ask an old cripple for advice, lad, but I'll tell you this. You've met my wife, Aphrodite. That's her. She's a tricky one. Lad, be careful of love. It'll twist your brain around and leave you thinking up is down and right is wrong. I thought about my meeting with Aphrodite in the back of a white catalog, like, in the desert last winter. She told me that she had taken a special interest in me, and she'd be making things hard for me in the romance department just because she liked me. Is this a part of her plan, I asked? Did she land me here? Possibly. Hard to say with her. But if you decide to leave this place, and I don't say what's right or wrong, then I promised you an answer to your quest. I promised you the way to Daedalus. Well now, here's the thing. It has nothing to do with Ariadne's ring. Not really. Sure, the string works, but that's what the Titan's army will be after. But the best way through the maze, uh, Theseus had the princess's help. And the princess was a regular mortal, not a drop of god blood in her. But she was clever, and she could see, lad, she could see very clearly. So what I'm saying, I think you know how to navigate the maze. I, it finally sank in. Why hadn't I seen it before? Hera had been right. The answer was there all, all the time. Yeah, I said. Yeah, I know. Frickin' what a great conversation that is. Well, it's a great conversation, but I love the ending of the conversation before he leaves. He's pretty much, he says, you know, hey, machines are easy to work with. People are complicated. Like, you can try to fix a person, but if you fix it too well, you know, it breaks and you can't fix it again. I love when you have grounded conversations, especially with the situation where he pretty much straightforward says, like, yeah, so Percy Jackson, the reason why all these girls love you and are super jealous is because of my wife, and I am so sorry. Yeah, the god of love is messing with you personally. And also, it's like, 
He's the perfect guy to talk to him in this moment. He's literally the husband of the, like, god of love. Like, he understands this so implicitly, like, hey, listen, I understand that love can really make your brain a pile of mush, but you need to listen to me, dude. You do have responsibilities. I'm not going to scold you and tell you what you have to do, but I can help you, and it's not as useless as you think. Like, he actually is, like, weirdly optimistic in a way that he's not when you first meet him at his forge. Like, he's sort of like, oh, well, you shouldn't even seek out Daedalus. He won't help you, whatever. And in a way, I think seeing Percy this way and also seeing that Percy helped him, maybe not in the best way by blowing up his forges, but whatever. But their conversation is is so interesting because you could sort of see he's giving this weird pep talk to Percy, even though that before he was kind of like this gruff, like passive aggressive guy. Well, he's a passive aggressive guy because you have to think about where he is. He's in his shop and he's trying to work. He's in work mode, like he's hyper focused on work. And now you're in a situation where he's pretty much like on his lunch break or off the clock at this point. Maybe that has something to do with it. I think it's also just seeing Percy in this way. He's like, I've seen this before because he, he knows Aphrodite, you know? But you know how he's seeing him, right? He's seeing him as the most vulnerable that he is, whereas Hephaestus knows what vulnerability is. He's deformed. He has like a robot leg. He understands when it's like... yeah. Well, he knows specifically the way that love can change people. I think he's speaking from experience of like, hey, listen, I know Aphrodite. She messes people up and you got other stuff to do. I was like expecting like a fest to be like a neckbeard. Oh, man, nice guys finish last. I mean, it's not like Aphrodite's marrying jerk Ares over here. But like he's like very honest about it. And I like that about Hephaestus. Hephaestus is a good guy. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great scene. And he's not, like, too aggressive, too. He doesn't come and just, like, grab him by the scruff of his neck and yell at him that he needs to go do what he has to he do. He gives him a choice. Yeah, he has a choice. And then he even says, he's like, oh, well, wait till daybreak. It's a good time to make decisions. You'll know what to do, basically. And then, because Percy has all these sort of tools at his disposal, like, wait, you know what? I do know what to do. It's not as hopeless as I thought. It's sad, obviously, because it's this, like, you know, inevitable curse involving calypso and he doesn't want to leave her alone that's a part of it too it's not just his but own he regrets selfish it. needs he has a regret yeah it's it's a sad scene i have mixed feelings about it like i said like he doesn't know calypso that well he ha- he doesn't really owe her anything even though it's very sad that he has to go um he it would just be just as sad if he abandoned his friends and he has like previous obligations to them so it's like she knows that he can't stay it's inevitable. She's used to it. Well, she knows. She's just waiting for the inevitable. She's just waiting for the, the sun to come up, pretty much. Yeah, the conversation they they have at the end is just really... It's sad because she knew that it was the case, but she still asks him to stay. Like, she says... What is it? Um, I told myself I would not speak of this. I would let you go without even offering, but I can't. I suppose the fates knew that, too. You could stay with me, Percy. I'm afraid that is the only way you could help me. Like... Uh, just gut punch. Well, it's a gut punch, but here's the problem, though. She's actually working maybe with Percy's fatal flaw where he has to help everyone he meets. And the only way to help her is to abandon her other friends, which if this is his fatal flaw, he can't help two people with one right. of them. has he's too, too impossible. He's too loyal. Yeah. He wants to be loyal to both of them. And it's like... See, that's what his fatal flaw he, is. He's like a dog who just wants to like you know, go and fetch for everybody, but there's there's no way. That's like my dog, like Rosie. Like she loves people, but the second like she sees people like having affection, like hugging, she like freaks out and starts barking like she wants to be petted. Like it's really <laughs> weird. But that's like Percy Jackson. Like you see uh someone hugging another person, he's just like bark, 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 bark. He's like, wait, what about me? What yeah, no, he's like he's he is very much like a loyal dog. But it's it's sort of like this this conflict of interest where he's like, Oh, I want to be loyal to Annabeth and Grover and Tyson, but also Calypso, that's sad. She's nice. I want to help her too. And also this place is nice. Like it's a real, like, you know, split decision as to what he wants to do. Obviously, I mean, I think it's a foregone conclusion at this point that he ends up picking going back to the real world and pursuing the quest, if only because what would the book be otherwise? Well, the book would be very lovely otherwise, but you have that thing now where Percy Jackson has a regret. He pretty much says, like, what if? Like, what, this is my greatest regret is what if I stayed? What if I went? If Should I stay or should I go now? Yeah, basically. If I go, there will be trouble. Uh, but Wow, that is exactly what this chapter is. That that weirdly sums up <laughs> this entire chapter. Is, wait, is it the Upside Down? <laughs> oh, my God. Much better than the Upside Down. Uh, Millie Bobby Brown, what are you doing here? She's just, she's Calypso. Hey. Oh, no. Uh, but yeah, it, it's kind of a gut wrenching scene, and it's one of those where 
it's bittersweet and i think not all chapters and not all books i don't understand when people complain about like stories having a happy ending that's not how the story goes at times yeah like, it's better to have like a, a bittersweet ending or an ending that seems more satisfying than like the storybook ending like i hate to say it also it would have been sad though if he stayed because it would have been sad for his friends like there's no good option here obviously but he's he has his loyalty to his friends i have to say this may be just my weird brain, but doesn't this remind you a little bit of the end of Where the Wild Things Are? <laughs> a little bit. Like you He have, even like... gets on like a raft and sails away, and it's like, I'll eat you up, I love you so. Like He wants to stay, but he has to go back home. It's like a weirdly similar parallel. I don't know. Maybe it's just because it's it's drawing from some sense of mythology or something like that, but it's like even like a weird island removed from time. I think it comes down to the core theme of, all right, we'll say it again, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. If you can save more than one person, you've saved yeah, more people than just is. one. And that's the hardest thing because, again, this goes back to the idea of the Greek tragedy. Sometimes the most necessary decision hurts the people close to you, like Calypso. But if it benefits and saves more people, it's worth it. And that that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to justify. That's like some of the hardest decisions have been made with those like the needs of the many outweighed the needs of the few it's so sad because he even offers to visit her and she says that nobody ever finds it twice like that's it like once he leaves there's no coming back like it's truly like it's a tragedy the most difficult decision to make because there's no compromise there's no middle road that he can take he has to pick one and both are equally appealing and sad depending on how you look at it it's I don't know. This is such like a weird heart wrenching chapter. It feels almost like a short story. There's something about it that just has its own internal um, plot structure that just there's like a beginning, middle and end. There's like this whole weird romance that they build. We're also looking at this as like scholarly. So we're looking at this a little differently than most people. I'm sure people probably think this chapter is really boring, but we like I love maybe this. some this... people. I don't know. It's very sad. I feel like just this would make like a very interesting like short film or something. I don't know. There's, well, some, there's something episode. about it that's like, it's an interesting, oh yeah, I guess if it was a TV show. Yeah, there's just something about the setting and the otherworldliness of it and the the fraught emotions between the two of them and the fact that it is mostly just the two of them. Yeah. Everything about this, like Rick Riordan got like a big old stew pot, put all of his ingredients in there. And then this is kind of like, if you boil this all down to its base substance, this is what why people love tragedies. This is why people eat up titanic this is why people cry during romeo and juliet even though they call it a love story but it really isn't yeah it's so sad and then the last thing she says is for her for him to remember her and for him to plan a garden, a garden in, manhattan, in manhattan which, is which so makes sad. me cry <laughs> uh, <laughs> b is it raining in california it's uh, my eyes yeah as much as i roasted her for like not really being as close to him as annabeth and all the reasons why obviously he should she's leave, the nicest it's out still of incredibly so sad. far yeah she's like annoying in some ways just at, like narratively speaking but you know i still feel bad and like they have the whole conversation where he explains what manhattan is and that they can't grow gardens there because a city doesn't have like the space for a garden and she and it's oh it's so sad and sort of in a way it's like wanting to make a garden in manhattan is like a metaphor for them it's like it's sort of not gonna happen really i guess unless you have like a rooftop garden there are ways around it but you know what i mean it's sort of like this this unhospitable place like they're from such different places so b besides going from all the sad depressing stuff what is the name of the next chapter maybe this might help us a little bit uh the name of the next chapter is chapter 13 we hire a new guide um have a little bit of an idea. <laughs> Wait, what was wrong with the old one? Um, who was the old guide? I guess Percy Jackson was the Percy old... was. Or yeah, Annabeth. Or they were trying to maybe I don't know. I guess they were gonna get the string and that was gonna be their guide. It's hard to say exactly, but their new guide is probably gonna be good old red, Rachel Elizabeth Dare, because she's immortal and that's kind of what Hephaestus was alluding to in his weird conversation with Percy on the island. Or B, this is where they go into the maze and she shows them where she keeps all of her bodies because she is a serial killer. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's really a, a mix. Um, so yeah, when he, he talks to Hephaestus, he says that Theseus had the help of the princess who was a regular mortal and she was able to, like, I guess, see through the tricks of the labyrinth. I think that that's what they're kind of hinting at. So that's what Rachel has the ability to do. That's my guess. 
He's going back to Camp Half Blood. He's going to have to find her wherever she. I mean, she's in New York, so not that far, actually. Um, B. He does go back to Camp Half Blood, so all he has to do is call her because she, she did give him his number. Yeah, that's true. That worked out. Oh, that's going to be the easiest thing. But B, it's going to be like they bring her and they're going to be at Rachel Elizabeth there. What do you see with your mortal eyes? It's like they do like the Legolas thing. Oh, my God. They're taking the Hobbit to Isengard. This forest is old. <laughs> oh, I no. I almost just quoted a really old meme, but I we can't because of the email we got that said we cursed too much. <laughs> <laughs> B, did you ever see the gift set about like... Uh, Using a catapult to get into Mordor. This is an old internet. Yes, I have. <laughs> it's I great. Have. It's real good. <laughs> Frodo, make sure to you know, tuck your legs into your chest. <laughs> uh, but I'm excited for this chapter just because maybe things are going to be happening. Maybe we'll find things about Grover. But for the most important thing about it, though, is that we're going to be getting a new guide and we're going to bring back, hopefully, my favorite character in all the series. Is is the one mortal that we're mainly focused? I mean, not the one mortal, but really, she is. <laughs> yes, she's like one of my favorite characters. I mean, she's interesting for sure. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing her again. I mean, this again, this is my guess, but it's pretty obvious, right? That it's her. Uh, maybe. Who knows? We'll figure it out. All right. I feel good when I'm able to actually sort of guess what's going to happen in the next chapter. <laughs> so, B, do you want to read some emails? So we got an email from Vanya who says, hello again. I love how y'all dissect every chapter and how you guys make references left and right really adds a lot to the podcast and is really funny. I listen to this podcast a lot with my brothers and it's one of the only things all five of us enjoy. Oh, that's nice. Oh, it's really Um, nice. My only request is that could you please keep the cousin to a low? I know you guys usually try to keep it to a minimum. Last chapter, ASS got thrown around a lot and I had to go listen to the podcast in another room. I can't wait for you guys to get to the Heroes of Olympus series. Ciao. Zach said this to me earlier, and I laughed really hard. <laughs> I mean, we laughed at this, both of us, like I sent it to B. And we're not laughing at you. We're laughing with you because we're like, are we potty mouse? Like, I didn't really think we, we fell into like the seven dirty words. Yeah, I didn't. I don't think we realized um, how much we said that. We, I mean, again, that's, I think, okay to say in a safe for work podcast, but we'll try to just tone it down a little bit for your sake maybe well for me it's a little harder because we already censor ourselves because both of us are pretty much like sailors that are drunk at the wheel during a hurricane at times oh okay listen don't be throwing me under the oh no i'm throwing us both under the bus b hear that i've thrown both of us under the bus the bus is on fire sarah's in the bus (laughs) she's the one driving the bus percy jackson's there (laughs) Yeah, no, it's it's a little hard. Like we'll try our best, but like if we can't catch, as long as we don't say the you know the seven colorful words that every salty sailor knows, I think we should be good. If not, I I I do apologize for that. But it's one of those where like, what can we censor? What can we not? At times, because you know, there's some things that we can say that people might think are bad words, like heck darn and gosh darn, mm-hmm. or heck a darn, yeah, all of them. Or um or shoot. We can try, but I can't make any promises at times. Yeah, we we try to tone ourselves down, but sorry about that. Yeah, we we do apologize for that, but we did get a good laugh because it was it was probably one of our favorite emails because it's great that like, oh, no. you have something that you and your brothers can listen to, like five of you guys. For some reason, I'm thinking this is like an old time, like you're sitting by the old wood panel radio listening to our show right between you know FDR giving his fireside chats. It's wonderful. So you have the other email, correct? So we did get another email, and it's from Nono. It says, hi, Zach and B. First of all, shout out to all the other listeners. Love to hear your comments. Regarding the possibility of a Percy Jackson series is my secret dream to give the elevator pitch for the show below. I agree that what Zach said about Disney Plus is a great possibility. Here's the rational business major showing here. Uh, And there's some bullet points, and there's some graphs, and it's great. Well, they sent us graphs. No, they didn't. I, th- I'm sure. Okay. I, I'm sure. No, no. I mean, would... I wouldn't put it past our listeners. Is all I'm saying. Hey, I love a graph. Like, if you look at the chart over here, I'm sure if you make that presentation, uh, Disney would take you seriously because they like when you hear about money and graphs and deficits. Uh, so Disney Plus will be the first to start off to pull people in uh, using Star Wars, Disney, and Marvel, but needs an original content to rival Netflix. Uh, it will probably be in the next two years into the launch of Disney Plus. When they start thinking about going into the international as the best way to ensure the scale, they'll need an intellectual property that they own, has an established fandom both in the U.S. and overseas, 
and has quite a lot of material. Percy Jackson is the answer to their problems. Uh, so then we have bullet points such as published by Disney Hyperion, movie rights owned by Fox, now Disney. They actually own uh, all the rights now because I think, I can't remember who told us it, but the musical rights were also owned by Fox, but they actually had a oh, fight. I like see. Rick Ryden had a fight for that. So they own all the rights because it isn't just movie rights. It's, there's a lot more to it than just movie rights because they have to own the television rights. I hope they get a TV show going. That would be really fun, though. Oh, man, would that add more podcast material for you and I? B, that would just add like an extra like 10 episodes uh, per year. And we'll just feel like we'll just have white beards, both of us. And we'll just be like, help yeah, us. No, we're never going to be done with this podcast. <laughs> the second we get that news, you know what's going to happen. I'm going to start packing up a bag and I'm going to Maui. Yeah. Uh, the fandom's still thriving after 13 books, six spinoff books, four short stories, and two satirical books. Oh my God, B, are we looking into the face of our own mortality? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, uh, I have a beard and glasses to show that time has passed. It could be a whole cinematic universe on its own. And you know, Disney likes them cinematic universes, happy face. Oh, uh, The fourth crazy. book of the second series had an initial print in the US of 3 billion books, where it's already established that if you're buying, you know what you're going to be getting. Yeah, uh, Rick Riordan actually is a very popular author. Like, uh, the next book in uh, the Trials of Apollo series, uh, if I remember, it's already uh, has really big pre-orders, and I'm excited for that. Yeah, I mean, he has loyal fans, as we can well, attest no, to. no, here's the great thing. You got the most important market ever. I, I, I know Arl Stein has talked about this, where if you can get the kid market, because not only will they grow up, but they'll ask their parents to buy all the books for them, but also when they're growing up and they get disposable income, they'll also buy those books for them. And then they'll buy their, those books for their children. It's a never-ending cycle, really. Yes, yeah, so it's great money. Oh, my God, it's raining money from the sky. Uh, to end this essay slash pitch on why Disney Plus will be <laughs> ending doing a show slash animated, it will not do so. For it will to be successful, it can't be in the right now, where Disney will make the missteps of adapting too many shows to their streaming business. Maybe they'll put it on Hulu as they own most of it. It's more adult-oriented and would just be qt disney adaptation sorry for the long email keep staying mortal no no well you know more than i do i guess about that sort of thing but i i hope something happens i want an adaptation because i think a lot of these um these scenes could be really cool visually speaking um it'd be hard to pull it off but it'd be worth it i think personally for me i would love to see like streaming like for me i'm very cynical i love the business side of things like i think uh this is a really good example of uh, trying to get a streaming show going. And for me, when it comes to you have to think of like adaptation, I don't think they're going to do what we do is like one chapter at a time because that's nearly impossible. Oh, no. Yeah, that would be impossible. Uh, but uh, we'll find out maybe in the future. And I'm excited for this. I mean, maybe they just do the Percy Jackson series and not maybe the spinoff or something. But Oh, unfortunately, they would want to do it that way. They'll... They would. It would just go on forever, really. I mean, if yes. you think this podcast is going to be long, a show would just the months of production, it would be a lot. <laughs> Even like when it comes to like streaming shows, like we look at series of unfortunate events, it's a great show, but it didn't misstep and didn't get the audience that it wanted. So it's that weird, like tricky path when it comes to it. Yeah. It's hard to, to get the right people to watch. Um, yeah. I don't know. I guess I have mixed feelings, but I, I selfishly want it still. <laughs> we all selfishly want it. It's like, you look into like the mirror of era said, what do you want? But besides JK Rowling to stop tweeting, uh, uh yeah percy jackson series yes <laughs> the first... i mean at least we have the musical right and that's pretty great well it's amazing i wish they would keep continuing and just adapt all the other books into like a huge I mean, five part episode Maybe they i mean they could i didn't hear anything about this nor do we know anything about this you're sounding cagey now <laughs> Do you know anything about this? No, I know zero. I know nothing, Beast. No. I saw a tweet that they like were sort of trolling people, where they're like, what if you did an adaptation? And they kind of like did a wink, wink, nudge, nudge of like, we'll see, sort of thing. So I don't know. B, what was the last thing in Pandora's box once she opened it up and all the horrible things popped out? Hope. Yes. <laughs> so you got to be hopeful. Oh, no, but to answer that question, no, I do not know if there's a ad new adaptation. I was just joking. Yeah. No, you don't. You're just messing with us. All right. We got another email from Unicorns and Rainbows who says, you guys are amazing. Uh, Hi, guys. My name is Anna. I'm 11 and I'm from Australia. I absolutely love your podcast and it always brightens my day. I'm a major Percy Jackson fan and just started the Magnus Chase series. I hope you keep doing this. 
Oh, thank you for your email. Oh, thank Very you so nice. much. It's amazing. I'm surprised we have unicorns and rainbows listening wow. to our show. Yeah. Maybe look into our hit classic, Horsing Around. <laughs> yes, especially like being 11. Like, that's crazy. I didn't really start listening to podcasts until I was like 13, 14. And people finding our shows in weird, wacky ways and like really being invested in being like, please keep doing this. I love your show. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, when I was 11, I had a uh, Lemony Snake at Blogspot blog. So it's not all that different. Well, B, when I was 11, I Naruto ran. Oh, no. Yeah, I know you did. That you. You have the air of Naruto <laughs> running about you. No offense. <laughs> For some reason, my anime club called me up and said, we have to Naruto run to dodge the bullets in Area 51, and I said, I can't do it. I'm too old. Uh, I'm so sorry that you were that person. I mean, I was a different insufferable person when I was that age, so we're even. Anyway, um, thank you so much for your email. So, really do we nice. get any um, iTunes reviews before I know how to run out of this episode? Yeah, we we got a we got one recently. That's is from. Oh, this is like me trying to say anemone, like ne- Finding Nemo. Gemin, gem nin my, gen min my. Oh my god, it's a, it's a tongue twister. Gen nin my. Genimity. You do realize one of these hosts is dyslexic and the other one is me who is dumb so i'm sorry for mispronouncing that but the review says <laughs> i'm sure if i looked at it be i'd be able to distinguish that, oh this obviously makes sense to me like y- you really oh, it gives me a headache <laughs> anyway really fun to listen to exclamation point five stars hope you guys continue to do stuff together we will we were just talking about it we're gonna keep doing this for a while we've we've established it's it's going to be a thing. We're going to keep doing this until we're spooky skeletons where we run out of material or we get bored. Yeah. Uh-huh. One of those three things might happen. One of them is- mm-hmm. Broadcasting to you live from the underworld. It's us. I, wait, B, you're in the underworld already? I, I've been here for a while. I, I mean, no one has this complexion who isn't already in the underworld. Well, B, I'm already dead inside. Oh, wait. Okay, now we're just getting depressing. <laughs> anyway. Well, it's like this chapter. You have to be bittersweet. You have to be happy. And then you got to be super sad. Well, B, I think we ran out of emails and iTunes reviews. Uh, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at B. Kelly Gorman and on my Tumblr that I feel insecure promoting ever since we got that email at twinpoetry.tumblr.com. If you want to follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at Suda41. That's S-U-D-A-4-1. If you want to follow my other show, The Film Cultist, the podcast where I talk about movies, movies, and more movies... Uh, you can find it there. If you want to email our show, you can email us at radiocamphalfblood at gmail.com. Uh, we have t-shirts available at TeePublic, so just go to www.tpublic slash radiocamphalfblood. Buy a shirt, help us put, keep the lights on. We also have a Patreon, Patreon slash radiocamphalfblood, that also keeps the lights on. And we've got some great things coming up, and I'm super excited for all that stuff. And I think that's pretty much it, B. Any advice for the kids back home? Uh, I guess make friends who might be helpful later wow that sounds like really kind of sociopathic to suggest that but i mean you know rachel is with there coming in handy i guess make friends in general and it might work out for you <laughs> yes uh my advice would be if you know to run fast enough you can dodge the bullets at area 51 no hopefully. don't zach no <laughs> <laughs> well b i'm zach <laughs> i'm b and let's keep staying mortal see you guys bye guys bye